So don't expect to just, oh, I have a nonlinear problem, I will solve it and see what happens and let it do work. Because you will instantly encounter 10 problems and you want only one. So the first thing would be try to understand what you are dealing with and pick a very simple problem to solve. A problem like, you know, it's only nonlinear in one way or you know it's relatively simple to solve. Because if you start with, oh, let's buy a scientific article, check the research they did, and reproduce their tests in FEA in hope to get the same outcomes, you will die. Like, it, it took me like a year and a half to reproduce the tests I did myself. Welcome to episode 74 of the Engineer Mind podcast. I'm your host, Yosef, and on this podcast, I'm talking to researchers, scientists, and engineers, and how their work is shaping the world around us. For this episode, I am very excited to welcome Lukas Skotny for the second time on my show. In this podcast, Lukas and I talked about nonlinear finite element analysis, its pros and cons, traps you can fall into if you're a beginner, the types of nonlinearity in FEA, and how to go beyond only clicking inside a software package and start to understand FEA from its ground up. Lukas also mentions resources to become an FEA expert even when you don't have money to buy courses. And we talk about the science of teaching. Ladies and gentlemen, here's my podcast with Lukas Skotny. But anyway, we know each other already. Lukas, welcome to my show. Uh, hi. Thanks, Yusuf. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure as always. Yeah. I'm um, the second time on my show, this uh, time with a more particular focus on nonlinear FEA. Sounds super scary, Lukas, but I know from your blogs and the videos that you are an expert in this field and you've been doing this for over a decade now. You're kind of famous, Lukas, in the uh, area of FA, I would say, unknown to some, but give us like a one minute bio, maybe, Lukas, of who you are, what you're doing. Okay, I, I, I don't feel famous, that's for sure. Uh, I like, think you're famous. Uh, okay, let's leave it at that. Okay. Uh, so, my name is Lukas. Uh, I have a PhD in shell stability, and I run a business that basically does pressure vessel design, like shell structure designs, and basically non linear FA. And this is what we do. So, um, I also have a blog about FEA. And the funny thing is that it started the, the wrong way around because uh, I had one company that was doing like structural steel design and I started blogging about FEA for fun. And then it kind of developed into the second company I own now that does FEA design. So I started with a blog rather than with a company. And um, since I blog, I also do training. I train people in companies. I train people online. I do online courses. and generally trying, having fun while doing engineering. And I guess that's it. Oh, I've been academic teacher for a, for a decade. So I'm complicit at least in whatever happens in academia. But, and you're also a good teacher. That's, I think I would make a bold statement and say that this is quite rare in the engineering space to be a good teacher, understanding the fundamentals and actually conveying complex topics in an easy to understand way to new people in the engineering uh, space. If not for the fact that I'm actually cold, I will blush. But uh, <laughs> it's it's not a natural talent of mine, I think, to some extent. I was just blessed because my father has a PhD in engineering. Mm. And like my entire life was around engineering in some sense, in, in this loving way, only father can teach you stuff, right? So when I was going to university, I knew way more than people finishing, some of them at least, because like I kind of like I was raised this way to ask funny questions. And uh, I remember once my father went back from a lecture and said like, oh, man, I had two rubber bands and a pencil and one of them broke. And how can you explain stability without two rubber bands and a pencil? And it took me like a few years to understand what he was doing with this equipment. <laughs> Quite interesting. Talking about funny questions, I'll have a lot of funny questions. Oh, maybe I, maybe I even stupid questions. questions. Well, uh, I, I guess that there is a joke that like there are no stupid questions, but uh, I'm pretty certain we'll make it fun. That's that's for sure. Definitely. Um, Lukas, nonlinear FAA. What's nonlinear in the first place? I mean, we're surrounded by nonlinearity. Humans are most likely to think in a more linear way. So nonlinearity, maybe it's not in, in our nature, I would say. Can you explain what is nonlinearity in the first place? Okay, so... Uh, well, this can be a very broad term to, to bring it back to what I do in FEA and design, basically. Um, I would say that the split between linear and nonlinear for many years was what humanity can and cannot do. And strictly speaking, most of the things that Saran does react in a nonlinear way that we can more or less foresee, but it was very difficult to calculate. So... 
For instance, if you have a metal element, you can bend it in a way that it will yield and it will just stay bended. Like you can do it with a fork, mm. oh, right? But it's surprisingly difficult, or at least it was surprising difficult in the 70s to calculate that. You could, you could calculate what would happen if the fork was indestructible in some sense, and you could calculate that. But if you would actually want to apply damage to it, it's very difficult in some sense. So this meant that for many, many years, engineers design stuff in a linear way, being aware that things are nonlinear, but not having the tools to properly analyze it. Because like, you know, currently your fridge has more computing powers than the mainframes in the 70s, right? So uh, it's actually not surprising that they didn't have the tool set. Like the algorithms were there, but like computing anything looks like weeks and engineering rarely have this much time, right? So we got used to thinking in a linear way, but somehow along the process, we lost, I feel, the, this understanding that things are really nonlinear and people start to defend linear uh, way of calculating stuff um, as the one that was always correct, as the one that we should do. And when computers got better, algorithms got better, software develop that was developed is stronger now, we can actually do the nonlinear calculations as we wanted way back then. Now, like, it's not as obvious because we have decades of designing things in linear way and engineering is a very conservative uh, thing in life. And it should be like engineers should innovate and think about other things. But there is also an argument saying we've been building ships this way since 1300 or something. And like, let's leave it like that because they float, right? So by nature, engineering design tends to be conservative in some sense. So the adoption of change and using those possibilities we have now is just taking a bit longer. But I think since last decade, it, it really speed up. And now you can find nonlinear design uh, starting to be popular and people realizing what it gives you. So essentially what nonlinear is that is that the materials that can be damaged, like steel can yield, uh, and, and like viscoelastic materials are nonlinear. And a lot of weird things can happen to material. That's one of those things, right? Like if you do linear analysis, you, you just can't analyze it this way. And then geometry is nonlinear. That's like a silent killer of FEA because things can buckle. They can en enter membrane state. In, in essence, you think that if you press, something will just shorten in some sense. And in real life, weird things can happen to things that you press. They can behave in a very bizarre way. And nonlinear geometry allows you to see this weird behavior because so far engineers wouldn't be able to analyze it. So they had to be aware of it upfront to know, oh, I'm expecting a weird behavior. I need to know how the behavior will be like just to analyze it. So that would be the two main topics. And there is a beautiful argument if I analyze two things that touch each, touch each other the fact that they are touching, does it make it nonlinear? And contact is like, let's say that there are two and a half things that are nonlinear. It's contact, nonlinear material, and nonlinear geometry, contact is a half of it. And if you have like a semantic discussion on scientific conference, that's like, oh, a linear contact and nonlinear contact, and which one is which one, and when it becomes linear and nonlinear, it's, mm. uh, it's a funny thing, but not very important practice-wise. Yeah, I appreciate it, Lukas, that you already mentioned these three uh, segments, I would say, like contact, uh, nonlinear geometry, nonlinear material. We'll get back to that in a moment. But going beyond clicking buttons in the software, Lukas, I remember when I was in uni, had an FEA course, and I used Abacus, and there was this NL Geom thing, and I just clicked it, and I just uh, wanted to see what it does. And <laughs> actually, you used Abacus in the university. Man. Yes, exactly. Um, going beyond clicking a button, like, what do you think as an engineer, FEA engineer in particular? What un understanding do you need to have to actually not only click buttons, but understand the results that come out? Well, I would be first to say that I'm actually worried for people who consider skill, like clicking a button to be a like important skill. Mm -hmm. I'm first to admit that I have a company, I employ people. And if we would do like a run, a dash, who first clicks something in like the software that we use, I would lose with any of my employees both hands down. Like I would have to ask them where to click to get few things. I just don't know this because um, to me, th this is not what I do really. I feel that what is really important is that you understand what you are doing. And 
I know how irritating this can sound because basically this means, oh, you need to be very smart and educated and experienced to be able to do it properly. Huh. But uh, the reality is that you need to understand engineering first and foremost, and the nonlinear FEA just supports you to analyze things you kind of understand. So if you see a problem, like I have a PhD in shell buckling, so to me, that's the, that's the part I often refer to. If you look at the can and you want to press it, I instantly know, oh, I will have a problem with this, I will have a problem with that. That would be problematic. So when I'm set up my task in FEA, even before it starts, I'm at least semi-expecting something out of it so I can react before. And the, it's a dangerous notion that if you know how to click you know how to design things because technically speaking, if you take a scalpel, you can, you know, carve someone up and like you can cut anything inside, but it doesn't make you a surgeon, right? And that's this knowledge that is required to use the tools that you have. I think it's very important and it's often lacking because uh, for whatever reason, we didn't as a humanity or community of engineers develop a way to teach those skills. Like books are brutally theoretical. The lectures are usually boring. And as you said, it either like you, you were clicking NLG on in a block in classes, man, like we, we had matrix operations. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's like we, we teach very weird things, but uh, somehow the practical aspect of what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And why in this particular case, we have to do this this way got kind of lost. And there is no obvious choice and no obvious source to learn it from. And I, I think that's a big problem because if you don't have a name of a problem and people are unaware that there is this part they should know, but they don't have access to, uh, it kind of gets forgotten in some sense. And then people think that if you understand matrix operations, that somehow makes you a good FEA specialist. Or it's just like saying that if you know how the engine in your car works, this means that you are a good driver. This is like a completely different skill, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point that you mentioned. And I, what I really appreciate, Lukas, is that you go more hands on, but also cover a bit of the theory. So you've worked a long time on a course, which is on nonlinear FEA. And before we talk, put it to the end of the podcast, I would like to talk about it now, because actually teaching people a skill, hands on examples, how FEA is done, is I think, I think something which is very, very valuable. But we also have to say, maybe you disagree, is that a course can only guide you in some sense, but it doesn't make you an expert overnight. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. how, do, how do you approach that problem? Because the 10 years of the, the decade of experience that you gathered, putting it into one course, like people taking that course, they can't become Lukash, a second Lukash overnight, obviously. How do you see that? Well, first of all, if this would work this way, it would be way more expensive. But um, uh, jokes aside, uh, of course, what you can't teach is experience. Mm. And this doesn't mean that learning makes no sense because like if, if learning made no sense and only experience count, everybody would be doing everything till they learn. And this is not how it's done. So I would divide the skill set into two points. The first one is experience. And this is something everybody has to gain on their own. And this is just the fact that um, whatever you learn, whatever the way, it only is learned when you actually had to face a problem that was so difficult that you were uncertain if you can solve it and you solved it. Mm -hmm. And this is why if you would like ask a PhD researcher or someone who te teaching uh, university, as I did, they, they would tell you that they learn the most in the first three years of teaching because it's the questions of the students that on the spot in this stressful situation forced you to understand something. And there is no way, like I can tell you my experience. I can explain what I understood, but it won't make this aha moment, which I remember a few of at least like all the funny stories in my blog and courses when I explain stuff in a goofy way. I actually came up with this, those stories on a spot because someone asked me a question I didn't know the answer to. And I was like improvising as I go to figure out how it works. And I can tell you the story, but the process that happens when it clicks in you, it's something you will have to discover on your own. And there is no way to do it the other way. Although knowing the story makes it so much easier. Because while I remember the stories that I spun up and explained, and they finished in a conclusion that was okay, 
I also remember stories that ended with, oh, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And that's like, this is what you're missing. Like, you, you just get the solution, but it, it's not a complete thing. However, learning also means that you need to be aware of things because the experience in itself is valuable, valuable only if you can, like, tie it to something you know. Right? Because you can experience something and it doesn't give you any magical skills. Mm -hmm. But if you have the skills and you have an experience, the experience connected with the skills and understanding of things make you an expert. And those skills and the knowledge is actually transferable. And this is what I do in the course. So I can tell you, look, you don't have to spend three years as I did, like randomly clicking stuff and figuring things out and, and being frustrated day in and day out. To, to finish it, I can tell you straight out, you have to do it this way, this way, and this way. This, this works and this doesn't because of that. This works and this doesn't because of whatever. But I have a certain experience you won't have, and that is that I know every error message in the software I use because I encountered all of them several times before I successfully calculated something for the first time. Mm -hmm. And this means that if I'm running a training and some other software throws a certain, like random error of some sort, I have something to tie this to. I don't know what was done wrongly by the participant, but by looking by the error message, I think like when I last saw this, and there was a time in my life when I did, yeah. and when you know how to do it properly, you haven't seen that. So that's like, you have the skill to do it, but the experience will grow in time. But uh, it's way easier to have the experience when you actually have the skills to use to gain the experience, because otherwise you're just alone in the woods in the dark and you're just stumbling around without a map of some sort, right? Yeah. But it's still you that has to get to the finish line in some sense. Definitely. What would you say sets your course apart from others, especially because it's interesting for me because I'm also a course creator, like from the teaching aspect, like what sets your course apart from others? For example, me personally, no offense to Udemy, I wouldn't go Let's say maybe there are very good, there are actually very good 10 euro courses on there, but I wouldn't go there and actually trust someone who just randomly created a course and talks about nonlinear FA and buckling um, and has no teaching experience. Well, there are many prob like there, there are many reasons why you may end up in Udemy, like not having a tech skill or money to invest would be one. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So I understand this and I, I will leave this aside, but uh, I think that What is important is the way you explain stuff. And in my career, learning career, let's say, I've mostly met people who thought that the subject they taught is the most important one, whatever they taught and however they did it. Mm -hmm. And I honestly don't think that's the way. I was at like, at, in the university, I would tell you that this is most likely not the most important course in your lifetime. But if you want to learn what I'm teaching, I'm the guest best guy to teach you this. And this is the course where you will learn it. You don't mm -hmm. have to, if you like, please, please do. If not, there are like B type projects you can have for like a lower grade. So you just, you know, go your merry way. I will go mine and that's it. So however, like awkward it is, I actually did hear at least a hundred times now from people that they really hope they, they really wish they had like teachers like I, I am at university mm -hmm. and it's not like, you know, it's so many weird skills that you need to have. Like, um, I actually played role-playing games, my entire high school court, like entire university and stuff. Like I have a very weird imagination because of that, but it also makes me, it makes it easy for me to spawn stories and like, you know, tell jokes and, and, and do stuff like that. And I understand that things are complicated and that there are things that are needed and things that are not, not needed. So I will already brush aside the not needed things and I will only focus on the needed things and make them fun. And this is why I don't do equations in courses unless they are like super necessary. Mm. Like, but this is like multiplications, division, square roots, like no, nothing fancy. Hooke's law is like the highest. highest yeah, yeah, like, like I, I, I don't get into differentials at all because like, I don't think I could solve a differential equation if my life depended on it. But um, I, like, I feel that it's just like my father said once, you need a pencil and two rubber bands to explain something. And if, if you understand this this way, and I was raised this way, it's not, it's not like an innate skill of mine. I was just raised in a way that if you can describe something to a, like your grandma and she understands, 
then you understand. And if you can't, then it's not her fault, it's yours. Mm -hmm. Because like, like at some very basic level, everybody can understand everything, but of, of course not everybody can be an expert in everything. That's, that's another story. But um, I feel that it's the fun and simplicity of explanation of difficult things without all this puff up scientific background that differentiates differentiate my course. Because I, I, did, I did a few, I, I have a whole shelf of FEA books behind me. And, you know, I've, I've been an academic teacher for a decade. And what academics teach you is that if the sentence has less than 20 words and average word is shorter than five syllables, you're an idiot. Right. So, so you learn to speak in this like puff up way. It's like peacocking really of science in some sense that if you can like sell long sentences with long words, you're an expert. Right. And I could do this science talk, <laughs> but that's like, what's the point? Like it only makes me look better in front of other scientists and like what's to gain. But then scientists write books for scientists because they want to advance their career. So the whole body of work we have about engineering and like FEA and everything else, when you want to read it, it's a book written by a professor who used puff up sentences and super complex mathematics to show how expert he is because other professors will read his book and rate his career based on the work. And you're like, sorry, that's like, that's not the point, right? I mean, like I have my PhD, I, I'm not aiming any higher. Instead, I want to teach people something. And uh, like, actually, if I would like print my blog, put it in a, as a book, it would be a very valuable manual to learn a lot of things. If I would give it to my boss at university, he would say that it's not science, it's worthless. It's just like fiction, basically. This is not what I'm supposed to do as a teacher and a scientist, because I should be like a serious man, I would wear a tie, right? So um, I feel that's the difference. And that's the important part too, because learning can actually be fun and it doesn't have to be differential equations and I'm so smart and you're yet not. Uh, it can be just fun. I feel it's kind of an engineering, I wouldn't call it maybe, maybe sickness that you learn in university. So if you're sleep deprived, you have no sleep, you deal with complicated equations, you're like the best engineer ever. And then actually your friends will tell you, yeah, yeah, you have slept three hours. Oh, that's so cool, actually. <laughs> Once you realize that actually is super stupid. Well, actually, I must confess that during my entire university career, I haven't slept maybe like two, three nights before like some project I had to finish, but it, it almost never happened. I, I was very um, conservative with my sleep and I always try to sleep a lot. I didn't party much either, so it was this much easier. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> that, that really helps. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> When it comes to books, Lucas, you mentioned books behind you. Do you have a favorite FEA book? Because the people well, will ask, people will definitely ask about your favorite FEA book. Yeah, like the thing is that I haven't published a book myself. And it's not, it's, it's not why I don't have a favorite book, of course. But the problem is that the book itself, I find it as a medium that is certainly lacking of something. Mm -hmm. I really like reading books of Professor Rotter. But those are not FEA books. There are shelf stability books. I just, I'm an admirer of his work. Also, I really like a book by Gordon, uh, Structures or Why Things Don't Fall Down. There isn't a single equation they are thinking, but it's like funny stories about Hook having an affair with his like, like maid or something and Newton hated him for that. It's like a random collection of random engineering stories, which is plain awesome. When it comes to um, FEA books, I would definitely select Dominique's Bad Year book on FEA. Yeah, definitely. I, I really like it. I have it. It stands on a shelf like... Oh, the other, on, on the other yeah, end. Yeah, I can see it, I can see it. Yeah. Uh, and so basically, it's a great book. I'm not sure that if you can learn engineering from a book in some sense, you know, but it's it like, it's definitely the best book I've ever seen on FEA. And I have like a lot that I didn't even finish. I just started reading it and you're like, oh, scientific path, great, right? You just flip a few pages, oh, one, one page of differential equations, that's awesome. Like, <laughs> you just flip through, oh, another one, okay, that's okay, that's fine, right? And I, I have like a stockpile of books like that. And Chrisfield Volume 2 would definitely be there, although I've heard from people who are into like learning the theory of FEA that Chrisfield Volume 2 is like very good for it. I just never felt I have to know all that and I kind of didn't learn it, so. I'm doing the practical thing. I don't have to write my own software to, to do it. The most technical thing I found on your blogs, Lukas, was maybe 
matrix operations with maybe a two by two the, matrix? Yes, absolutely. And it's, if FEA can be done by hand, the article ends with it can, but why would you do such a thing? Because it makes no sense. And it took me like a week to study online to learn how to do this freaking matrix thing. <laughs> But at least you can learn it online. There are a ton of resources, which brings us back to the point of online courses, actually. Having curated knowledge in one course um, is, I think, such a valuable thing. The question is, however, for a freshman, what course should I even choose in the first place? Obviously, if someone has an FEA, is an FEA wants to become an FEA wizard, then they go to Lukash. Um, <laughs> also, Dominic has great classes on FEA. Of course, his book is super, co super good. Um, yeah. Any other recommendations, course-wise? Well... When it comes to courses, I, I guess between me and Dominic, like, um, I don't think I've encountered anything I could recommend. Mm -hmm. Like, um, we have a very different style of teaching with Dominic. We're, we're friends, actually. We know each other personally. And uh, he, Dominic is a great guy. So we, we definitely have a different style. And depending on whether you like my style better or Dominic's style better, it's, it's up to a person to decide. Yeah. Uh, Dominic is, I think, more, more formal. He's also older than me. So he's like... Like he has this weight of, 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 of things, right? He's, he's like, he's a serious guy. Um, I'm, I'm like, I think I'm goofy. less serious. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely more goofy. Yeah. So, so that, that's like, that's a choice, right? If, if something irritates you or you expect something else, uh, I definitely try to make learning fun and it can be a bad thing. It can be a good thing depending on what you like. Right. So if anybody would like to learn from me, then starting FEA, It really depends on what you do, want to do. Like I have a course on the basics called the break for FEA. And it's like basic intermediate course that will teach you like from z basic from zero, how to start, how to do linear things, like how to understand stuff. So, you know, the, the most common things how FEA is used is taught in that course. But then like I just finished the nonlinear one. So if you want to like a step ahead and, and learn the practical things of doing nonlinear things, then the nonlinear course would be great. And, Funny enough, I learned the nonlinear things first, and I've learned all the rest later. And it's doable as well, I, though I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, I think, because it's risky. Because as soon as you understand that you can do the super complex analysis, you start to think you're an expert. <laughs> And you kind of think like, oh, I know this complex stuff, so I don't need to know the basics, you know? And then like, I've, I've seen so many stupid yet very complex analysis that you would not believe. And if you have a stupid model, wrongly meshed, wrongly supported, wrong, uh, wrongly loaded, the complexity of analysis means nothing because it's stupid from the get-go. And if you learn the difficult stuff first, like quote unquote difficult, then the, the, the basics, the fundamentals, let's say, you may think, oh, I don't need them anymore. I know that the, the, the advanced stuff, and this is not how it works because it works in mathematics. If you know how to solve differential equations, you know, the, if you know how to multiply, how to divide, you know how to add, subtract. It's kind of inherited. But if you know advanced FEA things, it doesn't mean that you know how to mesh your models. It's completely independent in some sense. So I would definitely start from the start, not because it's needed, Mm -hmm. but, but because you are uh, avoiding a danger of thinking that you already know it on the merit of, I know how to do explicit dynamic <laughs> impact analysis. Mm -hmm. When you walk us through the, all the topics that you cover th uh, through the course, can you maybe highlight the pain points that you have encountered yourself while doing your PhD and why you decided to put that in the course and maybe leave other things out such as complicated equations? Okay. So... Uh, th that's actually a super clever question. Uh, thanks. Uh, what I, what I encountered in my course were two things. The first one is I open a Bacchus because we had a Bacchus. Oh, every university has a Bacchus. Come on. So I open it, look at it and say like, okay. <laughs> and then I just start clicking around trying to do whatever. Right. So for the first year, it was pretty irritating because I didn't know how to operate the software and, and stuff. Right? But then I realized that operating a software is quite easy. You can find, like, even back then, you could find tutorials. Like, it, it wasn't like dark ages or anything, right? So I know how to click to make a, a shell. I know how to click to make a support, right? But you click quickly realize that at some point, you start doing things you don't understand, like how to define analysis, how to set up solver. It, and, you know, you're like, oh, I need to do arc length, right? So you Google arc length, and then you, you're smacked with 20 pages of differential equations, right? And you're like, 
oh, okay, no, I'm not doing that, right? I will just, you know, randomly pick numbers until it works. And I did. I'm, I'm a very like patient person when I'm desperate. So, so I made it work. And what I soon realized is that as soon as like, you know, you run your first nonlinear analysis and you realize, yes, like it start computing. There are no error messages. Your computer start to make noise. It heats up and everything works. Right. And then you get the outcome and you're like, okay, what now? Like you, you have no idea what the outcome is. Like you just look at it. You have it, right? It's a success. And yet, like it, you're as far from winning as you were before, because it makes nothing. It means nothing to you. It's just like a colorful picture, really. And so, those are two things. And the third one was that, since I was doing a PhD, I did testing in a lab. I do FEA, and there was expectancy that the FEA and testing will bring the same outcomes because like, you know, like if you ask a question two different way, but about the same thing, the answer should be the same. Right. And this is when I learned that it's so easy to make a stupid analysis, basically. And if you want to really have an analysis that makes sense, it's really difficult. So I feel that what I focus in a course is mostly how to make the stuff that works, like that the outcomes make sense because it's easy to run analysis. I mean, like, come on, yo, nowadays there is a wizard, like there are software you, you can have like drop down wizard of a cell phone. You just generate cell phone, gravity height, press play, right? Like it's not a problem of where to click, but to, to make something that's meaningful. And it's meaningful in a way you understand how to understand the outcomes, how to use them. And finally, I think that nonlinear FEA is not only about nonlinear FEA, it's also about design in general, because you need to understand what you're aiming for and what's the goal, like what's the idea behind the analysis to be able to make any sense with, of the outcomes in, in the end, right? So the course focuses not only on FEA really, but also like what stability, how backing looks like, what are different materials, how to apply them, like what problems will you encounter practically along the way? Those kind of things that I simply encountered during my work. Because, you know, initially every time, like whatever you do, there is this time when you do it the first time and you just don't know, right? And since I have my own company, Everybody comes to me and say, Wukash, what do we do? And I have nobody to come, go to. So I'm like, ah, I don't know, give me two days, I need to read, right? And in full panic mode, you, you check stuff, you learn as you go. And this is when you discover, haha, okay, this is the stress that you need to gain experience. Like, I understand, okay, now I know, this is how it's done, this is how it's done, this is it. And at this point, like, I'm pretty confident I can learn anything that I need to solve the problem that is within my grasp in, in some sense, right? I won't be a surgeon. That, that's for sure. But uh, but within engineering, if there's a problem, I'm, I, I'm confident that while I don't know how to do it, I can learn that. And um, all the problems I encounter along the way with like, I have analysis that won't converge. I tried 77 different solver setups, each of them failed, right? And I did, I was there so many times before that even like, Sure, you read about it like later on, like the more you know how to do that, the more easy it is to understand like solver instructions and stuff like that. So like now I have a formal knowledge about it, not, not mathematically, but solver wise, right? But, but initially I was just like, okay, let's try seven. No, let's try eight. No, let's try nine. I had like, like spreadsheets that said like, if you put this number here, this number there and this number here, this pops up, right? And, and like, this is how I learned initially. And now I understand why those things happen. But, um, yeah, that's that's kind of like the the important thing that you that that you cross. Like all the problems that I encounter along the way, like analysis not converging, how to deal with material that have very weird material models, like stainless steel. It seems so simple. There's a ra ramber goes with cool curve, and, and but when you start implementing it, you suddenly you realize, oh wait, I can't do this, I can't do that. So what should I do, right? And that's. This is the kind of things that I, I really enjoy and what I teach. And I think this is what sets me apart, really. Interesting. Uh, uh, going beyond nonlinear geometry, nonlinear, uh, for example, we talked about contexts, etc. Is there anything else that students will learn inside of your course? And actually, who is the course for? Is it more for beginners? Can you be an intermediate FEA user? Um, okay. So, firstly, I will answer the second part. Who's it for? Well, I wrote this course uh, with an engineering mind who has a little bit of experience. 
And by little bit of experience, I don't need, I don't mean that you need to have like a decade of working experience or anything like it, but you shouldn't be a fresher either. Like, I mean, honestly, you, the course is written in such a way that I assume that you know nothing about nonlinearities whatsoever. And that you start from the very get go to the very end, which means that like everybody can follow it. But I think that a bit of experience, like I know how to set up my model. I know how to run an analysis, like even it's a linear analysis. I've seen the outcomes before. This makes you soak up knowledge better, easier. So if someone is like a complete fresher, they can do the course, they will learn a lot, but I would rather have them do my first course first, just so they have the base, because there's the risk I've mentioned that when you learn the complex stuff, it's very hard to motivate yourself to learn the basic stuff later. Mm -hmm. because they seem mundane in some sense and they lose this magic of of learning in some sense so i wouldn't i, I wouldn't necessarily recommend super beginners to start the course they will do it and i'm certain that they will understand everything because like if you can do or cannot do linear analysis doesn't give you almost anything in non-linear realm everything is new anyway but knowing this should help so uh, i think that's that's what the course for. And there was the first part. And kill me, I have no idea what was the, the first part of the question. I just forgot. It's more uh, what goes beyond, like we talked about nonlinear oh, yes. okay. material, geometry, and contact. Like this is for sure covered. I mean, this is part of the nonlinear universe. Let's call it like that. What goes beyond that? Like I see you have hands on experiences. You have a bi weekly session where you discuss with yeah. people what problems do you have? How can we solve them? Okay. So, uh, firstly, like before the perks. Uh, what I think is at least as important, if not even more important, is that the course teaches you how to design stuff. Mm -hmm. Because nonlinear FEA is only a tool. I could tell you, you know, turn this dial here, turn this dial there, press a button, and it's done. But instead, I'm saying, like, look, this is a hammer, this is a nail, this is a hole, you need to, like, do this, right? So you're actually learning how to design things, and FEA is there to make it for you. But it's the design skill that I think over the years is the thing that served me better. Like it's understanding how things work, how stability works. It's a widely not understood topic that brings so many people problems that it's insane because, you know, I'm, I'm considered an expert in the field. So oftentimes I get asked by companies, okay, we have problems. Can you save us? And those are like the saving methods are there and I can do that, but it's not pleasure. It was way easier to design it good in the first place, but someone didn't understand what they were doing good enough right so you not only learn how to use the tool to design whatever you also learn what there is to be designed what to pay attention to like the details of the practicalities of design and they are useful even if you if you want to use fea because what i learned what is funny is that as soon as you re learn most of nonlinear fea stuff you just become a better designer even if you're not using fea because you understand how things work Mm -hmm. How, like, you've seen it in the models, you know how stress redistributes, like, what can buckle, in what circumstances, like, what's a membrane state. You just learn to see this and expect this, even if you're not doing FEA. So I think that's the, the biggest benefit of the course. But of course, I also know that it's not so easy to learn nonlinear FEA. I mean, let, let's face it, it took me several years, so, like, I put all my experience into the course, but it's still, like, quite a bit of work to learn, and I know that... It's hard to motivate yourself while you're doing this. So I decided to make like office hours. And of course, office hours serve, serve a lot of purposes. Every two weeks I meet with my students because there is a group that already finished the course and we've been meeting since the last year and they were doing the course as I was building the course. So they are like founder group in some sense. They joined when it was not ready, essentially. And every two weeks we met and we discussed things. So, you know, it's, it's a, a bit different when you meet online with, with people, when you talk with each other, you get to know each other. Like there is like this community feeling that's not like a, oh, I have a closed Facebook group community stuff. It's like, you, you, I really know those people. I know them personally. We, we've talked a lot. Right. And sometimes, um, initially I started recording those sessions for ICAR uh, archive so people can get back to it, but so many problems from work came out that people ask me like, okay, I, I'm doing this nonlinear FEA at work and this doesn't work, but we, I, I can't show you the model unless you stop recording. So at this point, I'm not even recording the sessions. We, we just discuss stuff. And I think that this feedback 
e even like for things not related with the course, like when you get to talk with other people and say like, I have this problem, how do we solve this, right? And you can like discuss with the others. You would be surprised how deprived we as engineers are from a support of peers in some sense. It's a very lonely job. Yeah. Like in many companies, you might be the only person capable of understanding the problem you're facing. And who are you going to discuss it with? It's not even to receive an answer, although I must admit that we are actually pretty good at it in the guild. <laughs> and, and like people get answers like almost all the time. But even if not, even if you only get to present a problem and talk about it, you get to think this through as you talk. And you know that listeners of, your, of you understand what you're saying. So uh, that's one thing. But also just being around other people who are doing the course make you kind of like want to keep up with them. I mean, like, it's a lot of soak in. It's a very complex thing, non-linear FEA. It's not like two lessons, half an hour lecture, and you're like, a stamp and go home. It, it takes hours of practice, like doing examples that are in the course, like quizzes and all. And having other people struggling with this, asking questions, kind of make you want to participate. And this motivates you to continue. Because I could wrote the best course out there. If someone won't finish it, where's the benefit? Yeah, exactly. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is also why I make the course gamified. You actually is, like you've mentioned it before, you actually start as a FEA wizard novice and you gain levels, you gain experience. When you do examples, you earn money. You can buy like items in the store that helps you uncover secrets hidden in a map. And I actually studied teaching online. Like maybe like I don't have a PhD in teaching methods, obviously, but like I'm, I'm good at literature there. So the point is that it's not only I want to do the good content, sell the course and be happy. I'm actually caring for teaching people. And it's not only the best content. It's also the engagement, the fun aspect, the community aspect that will just keep you going. Because uh, I know full well that I have a few courses that I bought and I most likely will never finish them because it's like, you know, 200 lessons and you're like, okay, <laughs> I'm at 12. <laughs> Sounds familiar. And you just give up. <laughs> Sounds very familiar. That's actually true. Like having actually an accountability buddy or accountability buddies and being in a guild, how you call it, is I think such a valuable thing. And I think more should actually um, do that when they are creating courses. Um, yeah. When it comes but to you know, it takes time. That's the issue. Like if you want to build a community, you like having biweekly two-hour meetings means that I have a, like a calendar and it says like two meetings of two hours of out, of guild and I need to set it up, think things through, discuss stuff. Like it takes time. And uh, it's not passive in any meaningful way, especially since we have like a closed forum and like things are happening there. So it's just time consuming to do this, but it's well worth it for sure. But I understand why it's not popular. It's, it's just demanding. Yeah, I think people listening to this podcast now are saying, when are you actually talking about nonlinearity, man? Come on. But what really, what really interests me is, Lukas, is the teaching aspect. Like, what was the most difficult part while creating this course? You have been building this for one and a half year. And I think people should appreciate the fact that once you do YouTube videos, podcasts, create a course yourself, then you will actually feel the pain of how hard it is actually to put a co course out there. Can you walk us through this? What was the biggest pain, like filming the videos, explaining it for beginners? What was the most difficult part? Okay, so... Um... There are a few. First was the misconception. Um, I did my first course in two years. And when I started the second one, I was thinking like, okay, I have all of this experience. It will take me three months to do the course. But I know that last time I was thinking the same, so it will take me half a year. And um, so that, that like, when you hit this half a year mark and you realize you haven't even really started because there's so much to do, then you're like, uh-oh, this is going to be a, like a marathon, not a sprint, right? So this was, mm, this was pretty hard. I'm borderline workaholic. So it's actually easy for me to just keep doing stuff. So there was no risk I will give up along the way. But uh, I think that at this point, it's over two years since I started. Uh, like, of course, I'm not, I didn't do the course all the time. Sometimes things in the company came up and I had like two weeks that I couldn't do stuff because we had to like, you know, do, do company stuff and I was needed there too much to, to spare an hour to, to do something. But um, effectively, I think that if someone would start doing online courses and it's not workaholic, which I don't recommend as a strategy, by the way, um, I think that giving up along the way, like this feeling of, oh my God, I will never end. Like it accompanied me for a year and a half easy and you just have to deal with that. So that's one. 
The second one was you always want to do something better. So the first course was like a typical, there are modules, lessons, examples. And the second one, I figured out, okay, let's build the map, have a character, like experience points, like graphical interface, everything. Like, let's make quests. People will discover stuff. It will be fun. This alone took me half a year to understand what I want to do, how to plan it out and so on. Uh, in not, not in, like including like graphical design, like technical stuff. It's mm -hmm. that, that was challenging. And I must confess that I'm a geek. I'm an RPG fan. So I was thinking that it would be fun. It was fun for like two days and then half a year of drudgery of how the hell to make that when you earn this much experience point, something happens. Like, how do you code that into your website? And suddenly it's not fun anymore. It's just like work. And when it comes to lessons themselves, they went very, they, they were very easy to do for me. I must say like at this point in my career, I just like instantly knew what I wanted to write. I didn't even have a plan. I just like every morning I would wake up very early, go to my balcony when it was warm enough, sit there in a couch and just type stuff. I didn't even have a plan for each lesson I was typing because I, I from the start, I knew how to do this. Then there was a different problem that was not the content, but rather how to arrange it in a way that person who doesn't have my knowledge can follow it. Because nonlinear FEA is an extremely nested thing. You have nonlinear material and geometry and contact and solver convergence and non-convergence, and you need to have this tool and that tool and whatever, right? So the best approach would be let's teach a person all the theory they need and then do examples. But I mean, come on, who would go through that? Like there are no dopamine hits along the way. You just like, you know, lecture after lecture after lecture, like uh, uh, at the fifth, you don't remember what was at the first. Mm -hmm. So there is not, that's not learning. So I had to arrange the course in a way that you only learn one theoret theoretical thing and you do an example about it. So you feel that you're making progress and you gain skills that are immediately applicable. And then how to figure out an example that can extract one thing when you don't know how to do this, 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 and that. The end of the course was easy. You already know most of it. So let's just add the rest and it's fine. But the first example, how the hell do you do a nonlinear analysis when, when everything is nonlinear and you know nothing at the start? So it was a gymnastic of sorts, like how to arrange the lessons in a way that you can actually learn a bit and practically use it. And this practical use required only this particular thing that you already know and nothing else. And figuring out those first steps was difficult. And I actually rearranged the course at least three or four times mm -hmm. because I was thinking like, okay, let's start this. And then like, you know, I wrote the lesson. I, oh, wait, they would have to know this to, to understand that. Okay. Let's rewind. Right? <laughs> and you just have to figure out the, the different route through, through the course. So I think that's, that was the most challenging. The, the content itself is it was easy for me. Yeah, crazy. Nice inth insights because I'm lo looking forward to actually um, buying the course and going through it myself because I'm also like a, a gaming fan. Let's see how that how that goes. <laughs> um, I feel like from even from a psychological level, there's this concept of like you have a stable state, stable mental state, like you know what you know, and then actually to go on the next level, you have to put a bit of disturbance in, but not too much and not too little yes. to actually go to the next stable state. And I think this is very difficult to, to do as a teacher. So um, I think you do that pretty well, especially in your blogs, your videos and so on. Um, now let's talk about nonlinear FEA. How would you approach, let's let's pick one example that you have, maybe one from the course, maybe another one. Um, how would you approach such a problem? Divide and conquer or what's the solution? Okay, so um, whatever, like, I don't know, let's say I have a pressure vessel example in the course. Let, let's do this like, uh, because we, we've designed so many pressure vessels that when I close my eyes, I just see them. Uh, so uh, when I look at the problem, it's not the FEA that worries me. It's understanding what there is to be done. So I think that the most important skill that you learn at the course and that you have to develop and further deepen as an engineer is not where to click or even how to set it up. It's rather what to expect. So I look at the problem and I'm thinking like, okay, what can go wrong? Let's say this can buckle, that can buckle, this can yield. There will be a fatigue problem here, right? So this is why there are lessons like all the types of stability failure you can encounter, how they look, when they manifest. Like it's not FEA knowledge whatsoever, but you need to know that to do FEA because if you're not expecting something, you can miss it. And that's the biggest problem of nonlinear FEA. 
So I will teach you like, you know, there is a problem of sheer stability in shells, for instance. Mm. Very few people know this because, you know, like it would take a PhD <laughs> to know that, right? But like a lot of shells are built and then have to be strengthened because of this phenomenon. So it's good to kind of know it, right? And then like, so you have a lesson about it. And then you'll say like, okay, I'm looking at this problem. What could potentially go wrong, right? So the first phase would be, let's understand like what the problem is. And uh, in the course, it's a bit easier because uh, this at the start could be extremely overwhelming. Like imagine I had a book in mathematical analysis in my university and they would do like examples and then tasks. So you had like one task solved from start to finish and seven others you should follow. And all the time during the example tasks, somewhere along the way, it was written as it is easy to see. And there was like equation equal equation. And you have no idea where this came from. It was like just slap, you know it or you don't like get lost. idiot. And I know, so, so me doing an example, like let's do whole threshold vessels from the get-go and you're like, oh, you know, it's easy because this will buckle, that will, like this will yield and people will be like, oh, holy cow, like how, right? So instead, each example focuses on one thing and I tell you upfront what this thing is. So I'm saying like, this is an example when we worry about yielding. Let's take a look what will happen, right? And this can happen, that can happen, whatever. And then the second difficult question is choices. It's not where to press, but what to choose. For instance, let's say that you are doing a stainless steel pressure vessel. Stainless steel is a fi very funny material. It has like a well-defined material model, but in FEA, it's not simple. There, there, there are difficult, tough choices nobody wants to talk about because FEA is too stupid to model Rambert goes good, good enough. You need to have like a linear portion of the chart stress strain chart and it's not easy to say how inclined the line should be because it's like a beautiful non-linear thing you just need to change into a, a straight line how to do that like i know how to do it but which one to choose from the angles you are you have there right so i'd say like okay how to approach the choice and i'm so like we won't do the choice let's do all the three possibilities or four see what the outcomes are and then we will discuss what the choice meant so I do the same example several times and I said, okay, let's, let's take a look at this outcome, that outcome. That, and you see, when we chose this, this happened. When we chose that, this happened. When we choose this, that happened, which means that when I have this problem, I need to choose this. If I had that problem, I need to choose that and so on. So it's not even like clicking course about how to click nonlinear FEA would take me like two months. Yeah, so maybe four or two years. Um, and uh, it, it would be just a few videos of like, you know, the whole class, please click here. Like, please enter 20, enter, right? And, and move on. But understanding why, what, when, in what cases, this is the, the, the thing that, that takes it. And when you finally have this, you know what you expect, what the problems you expect, because you learned the lessons and you know what the example is about. And then you know the choices you have to make in FEA, it's just, okay, now let's click it through. Mm -hmm. So there is like an example, like example has two parts. The first part is let's set up the model. I assume that many people will skip that because they will know how to set up a model. You can download the geometry anyway. They will just mesh it quickly and, you know, be ready. But if you don't know how to do it, there's like a video where I do it. And then let's focus on solving this several times and see what it goes. That's part, that part is actually easy. It's, it's the choices and understanding of the choices. That's, that's the difficult part. And, in engineering, in real cases, I, this is actually how I approach things. So I will print a, a, a A4 picture of what I'm designing. I will look at it and make notes. Like this will be a problem. That will be a problem. I don't know how to solve it. I need to read about that. Let's not forget that there are like rubber seals here or whatever, right? And then I was like, okay, so this material model, that, whatever, whatever. And then I can go to my employee and say like, look, this is what we're doing. This is the geometry. Like, could you make like plates, this, whatever, mesh it, load it. And this is what we are after. And that part to me is easier because you kind of have the steps to follow. It's the, the figuring out of what to do and why that's, that's the most difficult part. Uh, and uh, this is why I'm focusing it on the course. The rest will come naturally. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the one biggest misconception about London the FAA, Lukas? Oh, that's easy. That you don't need it. Okay. I mean, seriously, like the, the biggest problem with non your FAA is that people will, like I had people arguing with me that no, like we've been, like the most common is like, oh, we, we landed on a moon using linear solver. 
I mean, yeah, but people who designed that stuff had like double PhDs in so many different aspects that like they, they had the brain power that they didn't need to use FEA to design this stuff anyway, right? So, uh, but realistically speaking, the biggest problem of nonlinear FEA is that people think that they don't need it. And I oftentimes are hired to strengthen or rescue designs where someone thought that they didn't need it and they in fact did. So not understanding the problems is the biggest issue. Because if you know, in some funny way, if you know that there's a problem and then you need nonlinear FEA, but you don't know how to do it, you will hire someone, you will do it with trial and error, you will enroll to my course. Like you will find a solution because you know the problem. It's not knowing the problem, the biggest problem of nonlinear FEA, I think. Yeah. And okay. when, when it comes to like actual nonlinear FEA, convergence, I think. Like, you know, you press play on solver and then pff, you're stupid. You're stupid again. You're stupid again. Like, I hate you. <laughs> and mm -hmm. like, yeah, this, that, that would be like the irritating part. <laughs> Do you feel like there's also this other party not actually using nonlinear FA, but actually using it just for the sake of telling your boss, hey, by the way, I know nonlinear FA, here's the results, so it must be right. Have you seen that as well? Uh, I don't like. No, I, I, I think I, I didn't. Like, usually people who know nonlinear FEA are so far advanced mm -hmm. uh, that they, like, they don't need to use arguments like that. It's like, it's this because I said so. And that's like, that, that would be my argument. Like, if you have mm -hmm. a counter argument, I'm willing to discuss. But, like, you know, I kind of know what I'm doing, so that's the outcome, right? Uh, it's, I'm way more afraid of people who will say, I did linear FEA and I have 20 years of experience, so it must be right. Because... There is a knowledge gap that you have to bridge in the discussion to, to actually get to something meaningful. And I've been in those places. Like I did a nonlinear design, so you know it's kind of robust and pretty economic. And then someone did a linear analysis and got stressed higher than yield somewhere and say, oh, this will fail. And you're like, okay, though. <laughs> this will be a long talk. <laughs> uh, so, so the other way around, it's, it's more difficult. But... Um, Could you maybe be more explicit, Lukas, on that aspect when stress is higher than yield? I think there's also a big misconception around that. When would you pay attention to it and when not? Uh, I actually wouldn't like, I, well, okay. I have to be very careful because this is something like, I know what I know and someone who watches me may know something else. So if you get stupid outcomes, please don't ignore them as a rule. That's like ignoring problems is not a solution. Right? So that's, that's, that's a very important part. I want to be clear about it. But um, apart from it, I think that if you do linear analysis and you get stresses higher than yield in a material that's ductile, like steel, stainless steel, aluminum to some extent, most likely this is not as problematic as you will imagine unless you are doing like a, a rod intention. <laughs> Because like that, then it's important. But if you do anything, I would say, practical, when you're designing a thing that will be manufactured, whatever that may be, usually the shape is complex enough that somewhere you have like stress peaks, stress concentrations, various modeling problems, and you get stresses higher than yield, there is a relatively high chance that they will just plastically redistribute to other regions. And that's not as serious as you would think. Uh, actually, The, the highest stress is higher than yield I saw was like 5,500 megapascals for normal 235 steel. And it was mm -hmm. okay. It was like, like easy, like 15 times higher than allowable, but still like when you do nonlinear analysis, it was fine. Right? So, but please, if you see this outcome, it doesn't mean that it's okay. It just means that it might be okay. And the trick is that you need to do nonlinear analysis to see what the plastic strains are. You, because, you know, the stress won't disappear. It will just go to a bigger area. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, like plastic redistribution is awesome. It saves a lot of structures. I think that most structural steel components didn't fail, mostly because of plastic redistribution that the designers were unaware of. So it's like a saving grace of structural steel design, for sure. Right? But the problem is that this area can become so big that it will like plastically buckle. It's called plastic collapse. That, you know, when you're yielding, the deformations basically become free. You have a constant amount of stress, but the deformation, the strain, can go, like, easily to a very high value. So you lose rigidity of the model very quickly. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, how much rigidity will I lose if this is even a problem? 
and uh, how to assess if that's even acceptable. And without nonlinear FEA, you, you just can't answer this question. And this is why the current codes will tell you, oh, if you have stresses higher than yield, it's failed unless you do nonlinear FEA because that's the only safe way we can do. We can't say, oh, three times yield, not a problem because there are no rules like that. But it often is not a problem if you can prove it with nonlinear FEA. So, yeah. That, that, yeah. Very useful insights. Um, I make sure not to cut like where you say, where you give like the attention. Um, so we can maybe extract that as a separate clip, what to pay attention to if stress is higher than yield. Lukash, maybe w one or two last questions. One would be, people don't have the money, maybe the, the ability to buy courses. We talked about Udemy, for example. How would you advise them to learn FAA in the first place? Obviously your blog, that's for free yeah. and will stay for free. Uh, yeah, it will be for sure. Uh, I think that if you don't want to invest in courses, uh, it's always a matter of how much money versus how much time. Mm -hmm. And I for sure had a time in my life where time was a lot and money was scarce. So I spent months and years of like randomly learning instead of buying a course. Now I can kind of afford the course. So to me, it's a non-brainer, but I understand the situation being then being there, done that. So if you don't want to pay for anything, then what I would recommend is doing something simple in FEA and be prepared that nonlinear FEA is extremely frustrating to start with, mostly because it's a very nested problem, as I mentioned before. So don't expect to just, oh, I have a nonlinear problem, I will solve it and see what happens and that it will work because you will instantly encounter 10 problems and you want only one. So the first thing would be try to understand what you are dealing with and pick a very simple problem to solve. A problem like, you know, it's only nonlinear in one way, or you know, it's relatively simple to solve. Because if you start with, oh, let's buy a scientific article, check the research they did and reproduce their tests in FEA in hope to get the same outcomes, you will die. Like it, it took me like a year and a half to reproduce the test I did myself because it, it's, it's that difficult. There are so many things to consider. So starting this way would be frustrating. But uh, on another way, on another hand, I don't think there are any other ways you could do this. So, because like, if you don't want to spend money, like that's basically what you have available, right? You can, you can check scientific research, check the tests, try to reproduce them and hope to get the same outcome. And if you manage to do this consistently, you have the skill, right? Of course, there is a problem of what software to use because they tend to be crazy expensive, but there are like, like Salome Mecca Codaster thing and uh, Prepomax Calculix bundle. Like there are free choices as well. You, you could use, they are usually more irritating to use, yeah. but like, you know, the cost effect, like the, the price quality is infinite basically. <laughs> so, uh, so I wouldn't complain. And they are like, they have good uh, possibilities right now. So starting there, like, try to recreate something you can test, either test yourself or read about and just do it and try to do it. And as soon as you encounter problems, you can read my blog, search online, ask, like, I, I don't know if there are any like literally active nonlinear FEA people communities out there. Like I have mine in a course, but you would mm. have to pay for that. But, um, but apart from it, I'm not sure, but maybe you can find something. Finding some passionate, smart guy doing a PhD in a subject in a local university is always a smart move. Maybe it will require a bottle of scotch, which is a cost, but not, not a big one. Um, and you can go to the guy and say, like, look, I mean, I'm dead in the water. Like, can you help me? And if the guy is smart enough and like enthusiastic still about the field he's in or her, of course, like they, they might be able to help you and like, so you could relatively cheaply buy someone else's experience. Mm -hmm. But apart from university PhD researchers, I don't think that you will find anybody else who will be willing to help you out this way. So, so you know, local university with PhD researchers is, is always a good idea. Uh, and, and then just, you know, be patient, try, don't give up. And, you know, like, don't expect anything to work in like a few months because people have very weird expectations. Like they think that, oh, it's a PhD level thing. So I will just wing it and I will learn it in a week. Uh, good luck. I mean, like you might be a genius. I'm not saying that's not the case, but statistically speaking, like very few people are genius, right? So um, expect that it will take a very long time.
and be ready to sacrifice this time of anger and frustration to, to get there. You will eventually, but it, it might be not worth it. And like spending money on courses is basically spending money to avoid losing time and burning bad emotions to get there. And uh, it took me at least a year and a half to run a good nonlinear analysis. And I didn't, still didn't understand that because I couldn't design stuff. And I had a father who has a PhD in engineering, if I could call him all the time. And I was working in the best faculty in my country with all the experts around. And it still took me this way. So if you're up for it, do it. But if not for the fact that I was doing a PhD and it was required of me to do the FEA, I would never learn it. Like without external weep over my back that says, no, Lukas, you will only do PhD if you do this. So do this, right? Uh, I, I don't think that I will ever learn it. So that's the gift PhD gave me, the the weep that forced me to learn stuff. Got it. Maybe we can cover that in the third podcast. Actually, you and Manuel talked about this. Is a PhD in engineering worth it? We have seen <laughs> yeah, it's, it's we have a seen wonderful the third. topic. Yeah, it's actually a very good. I will link the episode down, uh, down below and people can have a look at it. And I'll invite you, Lukas, to a third session after oh. you launch your course and we can talk about PhD in engineering. And yeah, I think that would be great. That's actually a very, a very exciting thing that you said, actually, that it is a no-brainer to pay for a course to save you time. And I fully agree with you there, but unfortunately, if you don't have the ability to get the course, unfortunately, you have to put in the yes, time and go through course. the pain. But yeah, any closing remarks from your side, Lukas? And maybe, last question, we talked about time. Is there any other um, bad side to nonlinear if you, a, uh, apart from time that you have to spend? <laughs> well, definitely, uh, there are few. First of all, it takes time to calculate stuff in nonlinear FEA. So uh, I assume time, that you yeah. were hinting that. Uh, without a doubt, if you do linear FEA, you press play and like five minutes flat, you have outcome for whatever, right? Uh, the usual models that we calculate here, and I have very good gear to do that, uh, will take a few hours. The longest we ever did was like 22 hours for a run. So it's not a situation where you can, oh, I forgot self-weight. Ah, yeah, not a problem. Right. No, it, it actually is problematic. So you, you kind of develop, develop skills to check everything three times before you press play. And I usually tell my customers, look, the, the speed of this will depend on which day of the week we will start because we will manage to finish the models on Friday. We can run them through the weekend and it will speed us up for two days because nobody has to attend it, but the time is needed anyway. Mm -hmm. right? So the time is definitely there. It's not, it's not something that you can just do, like, you know, press play and five minutes and you're done. But um, it's well, wor well worth it, I'm sure. And that's, that's definitely, definitely the case that uh, you can easily um, outweigh the, the benefit, like the benefits w w outweigh the, the, the waiting for sure. And uh, one of my friends told me that uh, he likes nonlinear FEA because the time he waits in computing, he gets back with arguing with a customer if, that's, if the outcomes make sense. So that's good. Uh, I guess that's a benefit. <laughs> cool. Lukas, we went way over time. That's always, always happens when I interview you. Like, you think you do a 45 minute podcast? <laughs> Suddenly we're at one, one hour and 10 minutes. Um, I apologize. I thought all good. All good. <laughs> I have a ton more questions and maybe hopefully in the third or fourth, fifth part, we can talk about other topics. You have always of something course. to talk about, so that would be super easy. Um, I would put every link down to your course as well as all other resources on learning the FBA down in the description. Awesome. To everyone listening, subscribe to Lukas. He has an awesome channel, awesome blog, and uh, we'll hopefully see each other in the third part, Lukas. Yeah, I would love to. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Take care, guys and girls, and I hope that you'll enjoy the show. All the best.